It's still very much gritty and muddy and rainy and nasty and oppressive. Can a rat be there? Or would this rat be pushed here, causing this kind of weird space with the movement? I love rolling a lot of dice, which means I kind of suck at this game. You come across these people that are bad and you can kill them in the streets. I'm a reviewer that is very prone to um, care about player downtime and then setup time, mainly because I'm the one always setting it up. So perhaps I'm just being selfish, I don't know. Hey guys, today it is my pleasure to give you the Oathsworn review that you've all been waiting for. But before I get into that, a few disclaimers. First of all, this is a prototype. None of this stuff is final. All of it looks, you know, it'll be updated and look nicer in the future when you finally get it. Additionally, I'm only reviewing chapter one, though I've actually played an additional chapter uh, as well and with an older system, but I've still seen a lot of the same mechanics, so I'll be speaking a little bit about that. Uh, there are some mild spoilers, but I do keep them to a very small minimum. So, but if you don't want anything, then don't watch a review. In fact, you probably don't want to watch any reviews because you're going to be seeing some stuff. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention is that I, in celebration of getting more than a million views now, thanks to all of you for that, by the way, I will be giving away a copy of Orsworn with the miniatures box as well. So if you are interested in that, be sure to be subscribed to the channel because I'll be doing a specific video later where you have to be subscribed and comment. So you're going to want that bell notification too so you're sure to see that because I don't know how YouTube is going to look into the analytics about like how to show that video because it'll be a little bit different, obviously. So be in the lookout for that. And otherwise, let's get into it. So starting things out, I just want to say how enthralling this setting and world is. It is really, really good. All the art just looks fantastic on the character boards, on the map, the time tracker, even like the design around the tokens and the, the miniature sculpts and just the world lives and breathes a certain kind of grim, dark, um, low fantasy. Um, I want to say low fantasy. I mean, there's magic, but it's not like there's people in giant armor flying dragons and stuff like that, like a, a World of Warcraft or something like that. None of your weapons are really glowing blue mist um, or anything like that. Instead, it's kind of this very more realistic, rugged looking kind of fantasy that I really, really like. Um, it's just really, really good setting in general. Now, I said it's grim dark, but I, I want to point out that um, it's grim dark and it's, it's mature in how it presents itself, but it is still actually family friendly ish. Um, what I, what I mean by that is you're not going to see like a lot of nudity. You're not going to see anything grotesquely violent. There's not huge amounts of blood or anything like that. There are some mature things you can do. Um, as an example, and before I really get into this, I just want to point out Spoilers. Now, I've only played chapter one. It's only a prototype. So obviously everything you see is not final. So keep that in mind. But additionally, um, I'll be speaking about the game and I have to be detailed about it in my review. So I will be giving some examples, but you're not spoiling anything that you wouldn't see in the first few hours of gameplay. And in fact, I'll even keep that to as low as possible. But for instance, sometimes you'll get a city event. Like if I get over here on the time tracker, more on that later, I'd get a city event. And one of them allows you to essentially, you know, uh, you come across these people that are bad and you can kill them in the streets. Um, as an oath sworn, as a free company, you have a lot of privileges. You can think kind of like an inquisitor sort of thing. You're, you're here and you're going to do business and you have certain privileges above a lot of the common folk. And that allows you to do some things that are either bad or good. Now, obviously that's always a choice. So if you're concerned about that, you simply just don't make that choice. And then that can be easily uh, resolved. But either way, it is kind of grimy and semi-violent, but not in an excessive way. I was able to play with my 10-year-old daughter and she was fine with it. Just getting that out of the way. But that doesn't mean it's not grim dark. It's still very much gritty and muddy and rainy and nasty and oppressive. And so if you're into that kind of stuff, this has it in spades. Now, one more thing is just how fleshed out this world is. So there's a, a, for instance, for instance, one of the great story or world building things that 
Lord of the Rings does or Star Wars does. Let's take Star Wars, for instance, right? Uh, before all the new movies and stuff, you would, they would just casually mention something like the Kessel Run. And nobody had any idea what that meant, but the people in the world obviously did know what it means. And when you say something that you don't explain to the reader or the viewer, but that everybody in the story uh, understands, it gives this um, kind of subconscious look at how believable the world is. And as long as you stay consistent within that um, world view of whatever works for that world or that theme or that setting, then it's super believable. And they have that kind of stuff here. Like uh, there will be times, and I'll show you this later, where you do a pot's piece um, either a blessing or a gesture and it's like a, a hand gesture you do and it essentially means like hey I come in peace I'm not I'm not here to harm and you can kind of give that signal to people or perhaps somebody is mentioning that and so you'll see that kind of pop up something like that what is pot's piece I don't know for sure I doubt it'll ever be explained in fact I kind of hope it doesn't because stuff like that just makes the world seem lived in and believable like these people are part of the same society that they understand the rules and boundaries of their social structures and all that kind of stuff that I as a viewer don't but I want to be fascinated by so it does that really well all right now I'm going to go into the first part of it so each part and I'm not really explaining the rules there is a I'll link in the description below to a video series that's going to be explaining all of the rules in really good detail so you guys can get a good sense of how the game is played but either way, you're going to start out, and this is kind of the first part of your game, is the city map. You're going to get a few of these. This is the first one. And I, before I do anything, I just want to tell you how amazing of an art this is. I want them to give posters out. I want uh, this to be as beautiful as possible. If they had signed versions of this, I would probably buy it. These look great. They're done by uh, a really great artist. Um, I'll link to her Twitter account in the description below for you guys so you can see all the video games and movies and, and board games and all the stuff that she's done. She's worked on a lot of them. I mean, just look at the art around this. It looks really good. Everything's believable, right? You go to the stockade and look, there's stockades right there. You can see them. So just really, really good map. But you'll kind of be moving around the map doing your story. So let's go ahead and get into that real quick. Okay, now I apologize for my cracked screen and I'm not doing a phone grab, uh, you know, or like a screen grab of this. Um, I don't have any of this real software to do that and I'm just trying to get this video out for you guys before the Kickstarter so you can really see it. And this should be good enough. Obviously the app is still in development, it's still being worked on, but it's already pretty darn good. So let's go ahead and see kind of what would happen. This is very early on, I'm about a couple minutes into it. So you can go to new game, continue game, or tutorial. All that's not even working yet, so we're not going to worry about that. Chapter 1. This city's layout is not the intricate lattice of streets found in Thrace or the vast thoroughfares of Verum. A few quick questions with the locals describe the local avenues. So then you can click on instructions, place location tokens 2, 3, 7, 12, 13, 14, 16, and 19. This is one of the biggest ones because it's just at the beginning. So I've already laid all these tokens down. You can kind of see them here. So you can go to the... And this tells you where you can go. You can go to the market, the Broken Oak, the Banksmith, the Apothecary, the Archive, the Underways, the Tavern, uh, and then the Town Square. So I've done that, and then choose the location to continue your adventure. Let's go ahead and go to the Tavern. That's location 16. So to do that, you would move your, your one of your minis, or there's a little token, to that position. And then you would mark that, and again, prototype map, so I apologize there, on this time slot. More on this in a bit, too. And then you tell the app, I went to location 16. Ringing trickles from an ill-hanging sign proclaiming this to be the watering hole. It is an apt name for this place, or at least the last part is. You enter the inn to the sight of gritty faces and dirty mugs. From the look of the men, this must be one of the dives of the underways workers. You hold out your hand, palm up, giving the pot's peace gesture to indicate you want no trouble and make your way to the bar. Okay, so... That's all I'm going to show of the app, and really all I'm pointing out there is, again, that world building. You saw the pots piece, so you and your group of free company, oh sworn, go into the tavern, and everybody is like, hey, what's going on? And you show them this sign, and it lets them know, hey, I, I'm coming in peace. I'm not here to, you know, kill anybody here or anything like that. Um, and that's really, really cool. Now, when it comes to moving uh, here and, and then putting the token on here, um, this is kind of your time tracker, and it, each kind of... 
uh, section, I don't know if it's by chapter or by city or what, but each kind of one will have a different time track and different things can happen. So as you're moving around here, you're filling this out more and more and you're trying to like follow the breadcrumbs. Hopefully you choose to go, you know, maybe go to the tavern and you'll find something out there. Or maybe you went to the market and there was some, some event there that happened that led you somewhere else. And, you know, for it, it said here, the tavern is where the waterways people go. So maybe you came from the waterways because they mentioned it. Or maybe you're like, well, maybe I need to go to the waterways to find out about the people that go here. There's a lot of possibilities there. And each time you visit, you're kind of going further and further till the end. Now, these things like extra unique item or gaining a token, a lot of these or a city event, which a lot of them can be pretty good. Um, ha only happen if you don't mark it. So in other words, if you finish the, the, this part of the section here, you're going to gain an extra token and you're going to gain another unique item at the very end of chapter one. And so one of the cool things about that is it gives you kind of a sense of urgency, um, which helps the story a lot. You're really trying to figure out what's going on in this city, solve the mystery, figure out what you're going to be fighting. Because again, all of the, all the enemies are in either boxes or envelopes. So you don't know what you're up against. Now you might see some hints on the the map of some things that might or might not happen. Um, but e either way, um, it's just a really cool sense of urgency thing and a kind of a nice little system there where you just simply move the token. It's really effective that way. Now, we'll say one more thing about the app, and that's just that I, I would like to see a few more improvements. Again, it's in development, so I'm just putting this out here, but I would love to see a Chromecast option uh, just in case I want to, you know, cast to, let's say, my Google Home speaker uh, or, a, you know, a Sonos speaker or even a TV or something like that. Being able to pop it up for everybody or being able just to have people hear more than just on the speakers on my phone and not doing the whole Bluetooth thing, having it integrated there would be really nice. Additionally, right now, it only allows for one campaign. As somebody who a lot of times has multiple play groups for story-based games, uh, because I don't like to play without somebody, I'll actually play through a campaign maybe with my family and then with my gaming group as well, and then maybe even with my extended family. So having the ability to have multiple campaigns would be really beneficial. Now, one thing when it comes to this time tracker and the story, it makes sense, but I don't really care for what it, it, it ends up being within the game is the Banksmith and the Apothecary. These are two places where you can go to buy and sell items, which is very cool. And it's fun to do that. And you lay out the wares and you see what's available and you guys can pull in your resources and all that. That's nice and fun. The problem is you can get to a point within the story where those options are taken away, where it says remove them and you can no longer go and buy anything or sell anything. And so what that ends up being within the game is if you want to buy or sell something, you you need to do it the very first time you it's a, it becomes available. In other words, the moment you get to the main gate, it says to place all those, you're going to go do that. Even if that's not necessarily how you would want to role play the story or if it makes as much sense, just because you don't know when that might be taken away, if that's something you want to do, you need to do it right away. Um, so I understand story-wise why it happens, and I get that. But in reality, when it comes to playing the game, I don't care for that kind of break of gamifying it, where you're just thinking about the game's rules and how it's going to do this. And so you're going to act according to that, as opposed to just following the story and the clues and trying to figure out what's going on. Okay, that is pretty much all I want to talk about this part of the game. The rest is going to be about the encounter and combat, which I'm sure is something you guys are interested in. So let me get set up for that. Okay, so here I have a very simple game set up, and it's, it, I mean, there's stuff on the board. I'm just trying to prove a point, again, not really show you the gameplay. There are better videos out there that purpose are to show you how to play the game, so that's not this. What I will say is, for review-wise, I do have a, a few issues with the setup process, uh, and... and I'm a reviewer that is very prone to um, care about player downtime and then setup time, mainly because I'm the one always setting it up. So perhaps I'm just being selfish. I don't know. Um, it doesn't take a long time to set up, but it could improve too. And so knowing that it could improve affects it, even though it's not actually a long time. This won't take as long as Joan of Arc to set up, for instance. I mean, not much will, but it, it, it does go quite quickly. Um, one of the issues... It's just that if, if you recall my Aeon Trespass video, they have like the, the kind of battleship numbering system around here. And while this is super thematic and looks nice, it does already have a few numbers on here. So I wouldn't mind seeing perhaps a bit more. It, it works a little bit harder with these hex bases, which I do like the hex bases. It just adds a little bit more, you know, dynamic movement and stuff like that in there. Um, but maybe something to kind of help with that. So for instance, there is a skull in the very middle here. I don't even know if you can see that. And so you can try and like place them at the skull and then reference out based on that. 
Um, however, the the issue then is like these far away runs. Like there's not really a whole lot to go here. You can maybe go off of this kind of green stuff here, perhaps um, when it comes to placing the trees. It just it, it's a little finicky of a setup, and so I tend to second guess myself. And then you know I actually said, oh, it needs to go right up here maybe, and or maybe I had it here. And I'm like, oh, this is actually one more, and I might not notice that until halfway through the game where it's like, oh, that should be right there. You know, and actually, I didn't look at the setup. I just tried to do it kind of based off memory. So this is probably the trees. I bet it might be here or here. You know, who knows? It, again, just a little bit finicky. I would like to see that perhaps improved in some way. That'd be kind of nice. Now, additionally, and you kind of saw this with the whole where's the center of this, this is a hex-based board, and a lot of the enemies like this are on the round base. Now, the round base is nice if you're going to use it for Dungeons & Dragons or really any other game if you want to supplant it, but when it comes to the round bases, especially with large enemies, single enemies that are round and fit within the the hex, it, it's easy, right? It's easy to know where they are. The, the, the problem is with these, if it needs to move three and you're going to go one, two, three, and so it's going to go here, um, it, it gets a little weird. Like, so I just moved it here and it's slightly over this hex and you could technically put it to the edge of that hex and now it's really over this hex. Is this hex available? So the X, hex ends right here. I know, here, let me move these guys out of the way so you can kind of see what I'm talking about, hopefully. Let me see if I can actually zoom in for you even too. No, I am, there we go. Get readjusted there. Okay, so right here is the end of the hex. And so if I and if it's moving here, if it moves here, that hex is completely, completely good. If it moves here, or you know, or maybe it's this hex, right? So you're trying to find the middle part of it. Is it right there? And then if so, is this taken up because it's like slightly the corners there or not? Or can I move here and attack? I mean, I guess I can't with that character anyway. But what about a rat? Can a rat be there? Or would this rat be pushed here, causing this kind of weird space? with the movement. Um, uh, you know, it, it, there's pros and cons to the round base, as I said, but when it comes to playing, you get a little finickiness in that respect. Now, I am not one to dwell on that. I'll just house rule it real quick and say, oh, it moved or oh, it didn't, but just something to point out. One thing I do really like about the bases is this little arrow here. So do you, do you see the little kind of hidden arrow here? When I paint this, I plan on making it like a stone or something like that. That denotes the front. So you get this dynamic pose where it's turned and all that. But this tells you the front, which means the back is actually right here. So if it does a tail swipe, it's actually going to be from like right here, not necessarily here, just based because of how it's turned. Um, a, a very nice touch and very useful for moving and, and knowing where to face it and stuff like that. Now, be before I move on, I just want to give a special shout out to the miniatures and the art. I know I kind of mentioned them both for theme, but here I'm just talking about quality when it comes to the sculpt design and how they are in the base and uh, just kind of their their style here. Um, everything is quite unique and really good in action pose. And because of the sculpted bases, you get some really dynamic poses like uh, this one here where she's you know, shooting off of a, a piece of wood here and, you know, her arms back and her hair's, you know, her arms all straight back and just a lot of that kind of stuff is very, very nice. You get very dynamic poses that I really, really appreciate for my miniatures. They're really good quality. Obviously, these are not the quality you'll be getting, but you'll be getting hips. So it's pretty darn close. Nobody's going to say that's bad quality. That's for sure. Um, anyway, just really nice sculpt design and um, just kind of quality of the components in general. I've really been impressed with. Now, before I get into the actual kind of board and what I like and don't like about that, I do want to point out that solo play actually is pretty nice. I've actually played solo before, and I played solo on a on with this, a much harder version. They've actually improved that since then. So you get these companion version of your cards. And here you're just going to have two animus that you kind of recover back and forth, and then you just pay one to move up to four, you pay one to attack, or for a cost you can, you know, pay one to heal, or, you know, pay one to give up to two characters within three spaces, one combat token. And 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 then you can upgrade this, and there's two defense here. When I had my daughter who's 10 years old and plays a lot of board games with us, so she's pretty good at this stuff, when she was doing this version of her character, she was actually playing the priest, um, it was a bit much for her, and I needed to kind of hold her hand a little bit. Once I gave her this, she was just as strong. Um, except, actually, I think she was playing it much better. She got the landing blow. She was pretty happy about that on the rat. Um, but she was able to be fully autonomous with this. So if you had a few of these, or if you had four of these, you could play this game like that. No problem. There's not really a lot of upkeep. 
Um, not a lot of table space either too because they're all smaller. And in fact, these are gonna go away and this is gonna be down here. So these are gonna be smaller as well, uh, just as an FYI there. But either way, Solo should work really, really well. Speaking of the characters, they're all really, really unique and they all act differently. So if you're the witch, you got this stack of cards and you're busy, you know, laying down, you know, either either water or fire tokens and then you're consuming those tokens around you to like launch spells or encapsulate people in water or cool stuff like that. Or if you're the ranger, you can run from uh, like, you know, the treetops to the treetops and sneak mode and kind of traversal very, uh, very fast like that. And, and they all play differently too. This kind of goes into the card uh, combos, which I'll be speaking about in a bit here. But like, for instance, if you're the ranger, you're ranged, obviously, though you can do some, uh, you know, backflips and double stabs and stuff like that. But uh, for instance, we had a bunch of rats at one point, and so they were all on me. So I did a multi-shot, and I shot the three in front of me and killed them. And then after that, I followed up with a ricochet where I shot one that then pointed to another one and got that one. Ended up killing five in one turn. I felt super powerful, and it was super fun. Part of why that's fun is because of this awesome animus system. So in this, you're going to be spending however many you want to. You spend one per movement. You spend the cost depending on what it is you're doing, so four or three, or sometimes you can pick three to do that, or one to do this, or two to do that. Um, and, and so you're kind of picking what you do. But because of that, you can maybe save up a little bit so you have all eight, or maybe you're just down to six. You can kind of play with how you're doing. If you've played Conan, or if you've played Batman with their gym system, it's very similar to that. When you get a whole bunch of gyms, you feel really powerful. You can do a whole bunch of stuff and have one huge turn, or you can maybe divvy it up and do two kind of partial turns to have them do a really good. Either way, recovering six recovers most of them, so you're never wasting a turn. I never felt like a turn was wasted resting. That's not really a thing here like it is in those games, which is kind of nice. Speaking of saving up for future turns, perhaps with the gyms, one of the nice things here is the little defense here. So these are your offensive cards, and you're going to be playing these to be able to do attacks, which is nice. But if you're being attacked, you can add a temporary defense. Her defense is two. Perhaps I want a five defense. So I have to play this. It, co it costs nothing. I'm going to put it down here. It'll even battle flow. More on battle flow later. But now I won't be getting this card for a while. So I traded in some future offense for some present defense. And I like that kind of push-pull mechanic as well. That's very, very interesting to kind of be thinking long-term like that. Speaking of the battle flow system, that's really cool. When I had first played this game, and I've played this game multiple scenarios on and off for pretty much this whole year. I've been doing this for a while. And they originally had a cooldown system, which was kind of autonomous. This battle flow system is a definite improvement. I'm really glad they did that. So to, to be able to get this back, to, if I did the multi-shot there and I put it to the three and then it goes two, one, zero, and then from zero to your hand. So to get that back, I either need to play another three. So I play this card, even if maybe it's not necessarily what I want to do, I can play that and that'll make all the cards in the three go to the two. And if I played a two, then all the twos go into one. And sometimes I found myself doing, especially with the one, I'll play the one to move it to the zero. And then maybe I'd play my zero card to be able to just make those to my hand. And then I'd use my hand move and you get that kind of combo using all of the gems. If you plan it really well, it just feels really good to move it around there and try and manipulate it. Additionally, they have a on the zero, if I can find it real quick, they have a move on all of them on the zero code. So you always have it where you can just move a card for one gem. So you can move it to here. It doesn't do the battle flow. It won't cascade cards, but you can kind of even pay a card just a little bit, just to give it a little bit of a nudge, especially at these higher levels. Very, very fun. I really like the battle flow system. It, it really makes you think about, do I want to do this big attack now or do I want to move and be able to do it later because I don't have enough gems because I didn't save for the gems. And all these things are kind of fitting together and working together in a cohesive whole to really layer on the strategy level. And it's a lot of fun that way. Now, one thing I will say about the battle boards, and I've talked to the developer about this, uh, I've talked and I've talked to the developer about this, and it, I, I would love for this to happen, but obviously it'd be really expensive for various reasons. But double making this trade double thick would be nice. One thing we did find out is if you have sleeves, you're kind of knocking them. My wife had these kind of 
big sleeves that would move stuff around. I would constantly try and move it over and then have to move my, my token back because they would move over. Um, at one point, my son got up and knocked the table and our dice moved around. We had to reset them back there. You saw I moved the might dice just by kind of trying to pick this character up at the very beginning. They do kind of slide around. It is kind of unfortunate and something if they can do it and they can't pull it off, I would love them to death for it. So hopefully we can get that in, but you know, no promises there. I realize it'd be incredibly expensive for all the different characters, plus the, you know, having the art show and all that kind of stuff. I, I, I get it, but it is definitely something you notice when playing a lot is it's not super smooth to, to, to do this and maybe just redesigning a little bit, like moving the region up a little bit so that I can just freely move left and right might help slightly. Um, you know, you still have the gems moving around and stuff like that, but you know, having it in the middle so you kind of have to go around just isn't quite as natural. So maybe, if, if nothing else, move that up. Now, additionally, and this is just a nice to have, it's not a negative because as you level up, you'll be able to change quite a bit when it comes to how much animus you're recovering or your uh, cards and stuff like that. I haven't really experienced the level up system, but I've read enough about it to kind of realize how it works out. And they do have the cards here. However, um, I would like, and as much as these are different with the special ability, with the starting equipment that gives them different might and defense, with the cards that act different, um, one of the cool things I think would be is to even use some of the animus system to just kind of change things up a bit. Maybe the ranger has two less um, than everybody else, but their stuff is a little bit cheaper, but you feel that kind of push-pull of every little bit counts. Maybe they have a whole bunch, but they recover uh, slower. Maybe they have 12 or 14 animus, but they only recover four instead of six. Maybe for each you know, gym movement, instead of moving one, they're able to move two. So they, you know, they're really good at movement, but otherwise everything's the same. I think there's a, some play you could possibly do there, as long as it stays balanced, to again, just kind of give everything a bit of a different feel. It felt a little silly at the very beginning when you're first setting them up to give everybody eight gems and everybody six regem. It made it seem very samey until you read the cards the looked at the look at, at the starting equipment and read the special ability um because those are really what changes it and it does change a lot don't get me wrong but it would be cool to see that as well okay let's talk about the enemy phase for a little bit or just whenever they're interacting and stuff like that first of all i like the body placement of the different parts and how you can attack certain parts depending on if you're aiming or where you're at to them i like that when you defeat some parts you get a bonus like maybe everybody gets a two animus recovery system or maybe everybody gets a reroll token um, that's kind of cool as you're kind of popping off parts and they and they interact when you do that so if you blow up that part you know they're going to react so sometimes you specifically target other areas to weaken them all first because additionally as you take off like for the brood mother when you take the first two off then she's going to um, be in the stage two cards and then if you get four off she's in the stage three and her ai changes how she acts changes she might be more aggressive or defensive or go ranged versus non-ranged in fact if you've ever played a video game like monster hunter you might recognize this as different there are different stages to the boss battle and they might pull back and just do ranged or they might add a whole bunch of ads or do something like that very similar to that or even some mmo like raid bosses and stuff like that Additionally, you have their defense and how much they attack. And then kind of in, in the brood mother's case, at least they're giant rats and kind of how they react too, which is kind of neat. So, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll draw the card and you'll see, you know, what it's called and what they'll do. She'll release the brood and then she'll move seven to her target and attack. And then she'll move three southeast. So she'll kind of move down that way. Stuff like that is very cool. Um, so uh, what I like about this is how quickly it goes. If you notice, that was three things, right? So she's gonna release the brood. All that means is she, you lay three at her back. Then you're gonna have her move seven and attack. You attack based off the dice here, more on that in just a second, and then she moves, you're done. That's the encounter phase. Uh, if it's a reaction, if it's a full phase, at that point, the rats then move, they'll move five, roll two, and attack based off of their mob rule. Um, so again, it goes really quick. Like I said, I'm kind of particular about downtime and both your player turns and the uh, the the turn of the the monster themselves, even with multiple like the rats, goes quick. Especially the movement because of the they have a north and then west rule that I really like. It just adds like, hey, if there's any question, that's how they're going to move. They're going to move that way. If they're two equal parts, they're going to do that way. Unless there's a mob, there's a, it gets a little bit more advanced, but it goes quick. Trust me, it's it's nice and smooth, and I really like that. Now, I will say some of the cards are a little hard to figure out. Note that these have not had a huge um, 
you know, review cycle, they might get easier, but coming as a Magic the Gathering player, watching Tolarian Community College, if you've seen that, you know, plus one for you, it, reading the card explains the card. I always like that saying. Um, so hopefully we'll get to that point. If not, I did speak again to uh, the developers about this, and they said that they're wanting to add essentially a, a, a rules explanation on every single card, just in case there are any questions. I, I might even be able, we might even be able to get it in the app, which would be nice. So it's right there already if you do have questions, but ideally we get it worded where you don't anyway. And for the most part, it's good. But like Screech, I did have a little of an issue with. For instance, it says she then screeches, causing her highest might dice, which would be a yellow, and damage for each empty space between a character, I'm assuming that's a player character, uh, and the closest friendly character, max four dice, affects all enemies on the board. So I'm assuming you're counting the spaces between all of the characters up to four and then rolling that dice as i'm assuming what it says it's worded i think a little bit weirdly um so perhaps you know first of all defining character as only us might help um but it, anyway just it, it's not particularly obvious that in here you would count three one two three if she did it right now would it, i'm assuming i'd be rolling three yellow dice um so it, i don't like assuming ideally it just goes quick like that um, so if there's anything like that, uh, it's just something I noted. Um, there's a few instances of that where it's a little odd. Now, that being said, um, these AI cards are fantastic. You know, what, what she's doing is going to be amazing. I'm not going to give you, uh, 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 details besides that screech, which I just read again for purposes of explaining it, but there are some AOE things. There are some range things or some melee things. Her big shtick, her big thing is this release of Brood where she's adding, you know, up, up to, you know, 12, I believe, of these rats. You can get a ton. And they have a mob rule where they just keep adding on and attack you all once for this huge amount of damage, which I'm about to get to on how that combat works. But you can really have to deal with all of these. Um, and it, it can get nasty. So her thing is ads. I've played another one. I'm not going to tell you which one where th there were no ads. It was one single enemy, but they would teleport around the, the area and do like this ranged AOE magic. And so you were constantly, you know, trying to, you know, not really group up around them and make sure you could keep up with them. A lot of our, our gems were just chasing the guy, you know, just trying to get to him. So leap attacks and stuff like that worked, or the ranger was great for that because she can kind of run on the trees. So they all act very differently. And I really like seeing the variants among the encounters. That's something I can speak about more than maybe some others because I've played at least one other uh, en encounter where I've fought a different enemy. Um, but what, from what I've seen, it looks really good. From what I've seen in the spoilers of the miniatures, it looks like that will continue and the trend will continue to just be varied and different each time. All right, so the dice system. The dice system is amazing. First of all, I love rolling dice. I love rolling a lot of dice. I love rolling a lot of dice, which means I kind of suck at this game, but I'll, I'll kind of explain that. So with the dice, when, when you have your, your character card here, sorry, Mr. Guy, any might you have, you can get that. So I got one die here. I got this yellow die. This yellow die is great because it goes up to a three. So it has two threes, a two and a one, and then all of them have two blanks. This one only has ones and then two twos and two blanks. So yellow is better. Red is even better. You're going to get up to some fours and a whole bunch of threes there. And then you can get up to black where you can get five and then the threes there. Not only that, but these these symbols here, let me get to it. <laughs> can't even find it when I'm looking. Are the critical, they're exploding dice. So every time you get that, you get to roll another one of the same color. So you could just keep it going. And you, I mean, it's potential where you could just feel awesome, uh, which is great. That being said, it's kind of a push your luck mechanic because you can roll your might plus however many white dice you want. You could roll all of this if you want, get a really sweet number. But if you ever get two blanks, it's a miss. So you're really kind of pushing for how many dice can I roll to get a higher number um, without getting those two blanks. Now, anytime you do miss, you get a reroll token. One reroll token allows you to roll one die. So it, it's very forgiving in that, like, oh, well, next time you'll probably be better because you'll get that reroll token. You also get empower tokens, which allow you to upgrade your, your white die to a yellow die or perhaps to a red die. Perhaps you have two of those and you can get, you know, two white to two red. And so then you add your might on top of that, maybe even one more for good luck. That's going to be nice. That's going to be really fun to roll. Part of the reason that's really fun to roll is the defense system. So you notice she has six health. You'll have six health. I didn't, you know, here, let's mark that. And then two defense here. She has two defense. 
It's division is actually what you're doing. So uh, you're you're seeing, let's say that I'm trying to hurt her and she has two health. And perhaps I just rolled a two, a one, and a one and pretend that wasn't a, a critical. So I have rolled four against her. That is four divided by two, which is two damage. What's nice about that is, first of all, it's really, I mean, you're not dealing with huge numbers here or anything like that. Even with this, it's nothing major. My kids are able to do it. And again, one of them's 10 years old. So the division works pretty okay. Um, and, and you're not dealing with remainders or anything like that. It's just how much can you get there? So if I had gotten five, it still would have only been two. I would have had to get one more to get that, that um, that's, uh, you know, to get that four to a three. And that's really nice because that means if you get an, a small upgrade, even if it's just the priest buffing you and giving you one extra defense, the difference between the two and the three in defense could mean multiple, you know, depending on, on, on the kind of the math, multiple different uh, values. So, and it's like, oh man, I may have not gotten hurt at all, or I may have gotten two damage from that. And two damage on a six is pretty devastating. So it scales really well and it feels very impactful when you get you know, an, an upgraded item. So you go from a two to maybe, you know, a three. So you have extra defense. It feels really good because now th that three is going to help you a lot more than you would think was just one extra value there. So that's a lot of fun. And it just means you're really trying to see if, you know, if it had this much defense, you, and if it has two health, I know I need to do at least uh, four damage to it to be able to do that. And so I'm trying to figure out what are my chances of getting four on four white die versus what are my chances of up either adding more white die, but then I might miss or perhaps upgrading two of them to yellow. Oh, I I'll probably get four then that might be nice. Um, so it's this kind of push and pull mechanic, the push your luck mechanic, trying to figure out how close you can get to the number you need without going too over or risking a uh, misses. Uh, very, very good, very strategic, and I really, really like the dice system here, mainly because if I want to be fun and I want to have a good time, I can try and headbutt with 10 dice, and that's just fun. Now, I talked about dice, but I didn't talk about these cards that have the dice symbol here. What's nice about this is this is the same thing. It simulates the die values, and it averages throughout the whole thing, so this whole deck has the same probability as this one die here. Um, which is kind of nice. What's interesting is that it doesn't go back in. And so if, if you get some of these and you're, and you can choose which one you want to do, you can do dice or cards. If this is what you did, and you notice all these twos out here. If, if you're doing that for the enemy, then you know there's probably, there's now less twos out of this. So the probability of getting that high of a value is actually less. So you can kind of gain the system. But what if they played a whole bunch of, uh, blanks and ones? And so that was what happened. You're like, well, that kind of sucks because those are all the low values there. So now the probability in this is quite high, as you can see, that there's going to be a 2 in there, right? It's going to be a higher value. You can actually pay to add these. It just, it's just a one animus, but it takes up the card that could have been an attack and add this back on there. So you're like, you know what? We're going to add that. We're going to reshuffle it and reset the probability because I don't like the probability. But maybe you don't want to because it's actually good probability for you. Me personally, I love rolling dice. So I roll dice, but I always use the cards for the enemy attacks because then I, I hate rolling against myself or having somebody roll against me. It's just kind of an odd situation. Just drawing the cards and knowing that is, is kind of exciting. And again, you're then gaming. If she's going to attack with these die and she's going to do three yellow and three white, I'm going to be trying to do that card count, seeing if maybe before she attacks, I want to reset the deck. Uh, again, just more and more kind of very simple and straightforward game mechanics that layer onto each other in a really neat way. Now, eventually you're going to kill her and you're going to get some loot. And the loot's really cool. Again, this prototype actually didn't have the loot there, but I've gotten it in the version that I have played before. And it's very thematic and it's good. And like I said, the upgrades you get are meaningful. So you you, you see some... You know, like you might have a, a yellow bow here and then you, you'll eventually get one with like two blacks. It gets kind of ridiculous. You just feel really powerful and it, it's just neat. Now, eventually you might actually succumb to the hits and go unconscious, unconscious here. Um, there is no permanent player death unless you're playing on like a, hard co a hardcore mode. At the end, you will get an injury card. But other than that, you get to keep going. Now... One of the things you can do is when, when, when his injury goes, you can actually gain allies. And the allies are really, really cool. I'm not going to show you all of them. You're going to start with some man at arms. These are your basic guys. Essentially, one of your, they'll come and replace it. So you're not out of the game. It's not player elimination, which is 
I hate that, so I'm glad it's not that. Everybody's playing for the whole time. Um, but, you know, you might get Midge. And Midge is an ally who's not even in combat. We loved poking fun at him. He's he's great. He's the mayor of Bastogne. Or you might get Dane, and he rolls a yellow with a three defense, and he has plus one range because of his weapon. So they get kind of interesting. I really like the ally system here. It's great that it's handled in a player loss because that's fantastic that you're not out of the game. You can still play. And, in fact, we played one. I played one with the developers where Dane was doing the best of everybody. He was really, really good. Dane, Dane did well for himself. Um, but you know, they all have different kind of perks. Some can get, are better at some enemies than others or might provide bonus defenses or something like that. Um, and it's just kind of interesting to find them because you, you won't find them all. I've gone through this several times and there are some I've never had before. I've never even encountered the people. I don't know where they are. There must be somewhere in the story that I just haven't even found out yet. Okay. All right. So that is is my review of Osworn, at least for now. Once we get the full game, which you better believe I'll be getting it, I'll be playing it, and I'll do a full-fledged review where I'll talk about that, especially because I, I know they're going to continue to fine-tune and improve things, and I'm looking forward to that. What I will say, because I know you guys love ratings, is I rate this 8,956,385,272,647 and three grains of sand out of one annoyed young Padawan named Anakin. So that's my rating for Osworn. It is a blast. Everybody that has played this has enjoyed it. My my friends have, my wife has, she's picky, my kids have, and they're crazy. I have probably all of the above. It's really, really fun. I like the the story is told very well. The 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 die system's good. The RPG mechanics are great. The the gems are good. It's a fun game, and the quality, like I said, with the hips plastic, with the sculpt design, with the art, with the thick cardboard they already have on their prototypes, it's gonna be a good one. And I'm super stoked for it. Really, really fun game. Been happy with it since I first played it, and it just gets better and better. All right, guys, that's my review for Osworn Into the Deep Wood by Shadowborn Games. There's a link in the description below to the preview page, and once the campaign is launched on October 8th, there'll be a link to the actual Kickstarter itself so you can go back it or investigate more and see what it is you might like and what it is you might be interested in. Additionally, I will be doing a day one video, so on the 8th I will have an additional video covering the Kickstarter, going over the add-ons, the pledge tiers, kind of a game synopsis, just all the information you would need to know if you want that or not. So be on the lookout for that. As always, guys, thanks so much for watching. I'll talk to you soon.